Thanks for joining me tonight on Freedom is Scary, episode 18. And tonight I want to talk about elected prosecutors and what it means in regards to your liberty or our liberty as citizens. I'm going to have a special guest with us on tonight, hopefully, Benjamin Hatfield. And I'll get I'll get more to that here in a second. And uh so he is the Republican nominee for prosecuting attorney of Raleigh County, West Virginia, and that's Beckley. Um, most state level prosecutors are elected politicians, believe it or not. They run in party elections that have affiliations of, for instance, Republican or Democrat. And people need to realize that these are enormously powerful positions that usually just coast under the radar as far as the political races go. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Let's see. You may have heard in the news that George Soros has been funding prosecutor races all over the country. Or you may not heard that have heard that in the news, but that's what's happening. In fact, a lot of the, the lawlessness and injustice that you will see on the TV happening in some of the Democrat-run cities around the country are happening with um, prosecutors who are Democrats. And you may not have realized that there may be a difference in a Democrat prosecutor and a Republican prosecutor. And that may not make a whole lot of sense at first, and it maybe it shouldn't make sense, but that's the reality of the time that we live in. So in the jurisdiction that you're in, there very well may be a prosecutor race that's underway, and you don't know about it yet. And these are usually not the sorts of things where you see debates um, or where you see really any media coverage whatsoever. So how are you going to know what to ask people um, what to find out about your prosecutors. And that's part of what we're going to talk about here. Let's see. Trying to get Ben in here. Yeah, Ben messaged me and said he's trying to get in, but hasn't appeared yet. So bear with me just a second. I'll send him another invite. But if you have any any questions about what you want to ask uh, prosecutors or, or your prosecutors that are running, um, go ahead and, and and put that in the in the comment section, and hopefully we can get to it. Let's see. All right, Ben, I'm sending you another one. Try that one. All right, well, while, while he's trying to get in, um, let me tell you about this article. I haven't posted it anywhere yet, but it's a really, really good article about this whole situation of Soros funding these prosecutor races around the country. It was on the American Conservative, written by Pat Nolan on November, uh, excuse me, on September 11th of this year, and it's titled "Beware of George Soros's Trojan Horse Prosecutors," and that's exactly what I'm warning about. A lot of what you've heard around the country have been these so-called woke prosecutors that see themselves more as social justice warriors than they do as somebody who's trying to achieve justice or see that justice is done. Let's see. Misplaced hillbilly. Are you a commie or a commie sympathizer is my first question. Then we'll see how it goes. Well, it it's funny because when if you've ever bought a gun through an FFL dealer, that you know that one of the questions that you have to answer on the form is have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And it's funny that now, you know, fast forward to 2020, 
that used to be a bad thing, but now really there's a lot of people, even politicians bragging about it. So, you know, that's not a, that's not really a far out question nowadays. So some of the examples, you may wonder who are some of these George Soros prosecutors? Well, these are places that, that and people you may have heard of. Um, St. Louis, St. Louis, the circuit attorney, Kim Gardner, according to this article, was given $307,000 by Soros. And this is where not only did you have all the, a lot of rioting and violence, but you also had the McCloskey situation. And that's one of the, the really the main examples that pops in my head of you got to be careful of where you live. Because in certain jurisdictions, the government may not stand behind you if you have to use lawful deadly force. And the McCloskeys, the McCloskeys didn't even do that. All they did was stand in front of their house with firearms. They didn't even use them. So Kim Gardner, 307 grand from George Soros. She dismissed all charges against the 36 people that were arrested for violence there in St. Louis. And during that period of time, there were like eight police officers in St. Louis who were shot. At the same time, she, as you saw on TV, she rushed to file charges against Mark and Patricia McCloskey for just standing out in front of their house. And that's the difference Huh, we're having a, having a problem with him getting in. Maybe we'll try it another way here. Text, uh, message me your your email address, and I'll, I'll try it by email and see if that works better. All right, so the McCloskeys, that was St. Louis when they were charged. And so you have the elected prosecutor, or prosecutor's office favoring one side that they agree with politically and punishing the other side that maybe they don't even disagree with politically. Who knows? Because that didn't even come up. But that's what her political side wants to happen. So that's what she did. Now, I'm in West Virginia. Many of us, most of us maybe, I don't know, are in West Virginia. We don't have the same the same dynamics, the same situation going on that there is in St. Louis. But it, it things can change. Now, as far as I know, George Soros hasn't been active in, in West Virginia as of yet funding any prosecutors' races, but I, I really don't know. It's possible. I guess I should have tried this beforehand. Chicago, Illinois State Attorney Kim Fox, 817 grand from George Soros. She refused to prosecute rioters who violated the curfew imposed to quell the violence. She said, the question it comes down to is, is it a good use of our time and resources? No, it's not. Um, as in many of these cities, they supported what was going on. And not only did they not punish any of the the destruction of private property that, or the violence that was occurring, they took other political actions. It was the same Kim Fox in Chicago, again, 817 grand from George Soros, who dismissed the charges against Jesse Smollett. If you recall, he was the one who blamed two Trump supporters for allegedly beating them up. And it turns out he just made it all up. And she was the one who dismissed the charges against him. Philadelphia, Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner. Okay, there we got him on. Um, just one second. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner, $1.7 million from George Soros. He announced that he won't prosecute anybody for the violence that was occurring in his city for days with cars torched with other, with, with homes uh, looted. He said prosecution alone will achieve nothing close to justice, not when power imbalances and lack, lack of accountability make it possible for government actors, including police or prosecutors, to regularly take life or liberty unjustly and face no criminal or career penalty. 
So what's the result in these places where you have the Soros prosecutors, where you have the political Democrat prosecutors? Shooting incidents in Philadelphia have gone up 57% just in the last year. Um, there have been 201 homicides so far just this year in Philadelphia, 24% uh, higher than the year before. San Francisco, I don't know, Chase, Chesa Boudin, I don't know how you pronounce that, 620 grand from George Soros. And that prosecutor says the criminal justice system isn't just massive and brutal, it's also racist. Under this new Soros prosecutor's the policies in San Francisco, you have homicides up 25%, burglary up 42%, motor vehicle theft up 31%, arson up 45% uh, compared to the same time last year. Car break-ins have reached epidemic proportions with roughly 70 smash and grabs a day in San Francisco. Portland, where, where rioting is still going on, the district attorney there, Mike Schmidt, $230,000 from George Soros. He refuses to prosecute rioters who have burned and looted his city for over 90 days straight, all summer, basically. Now, closer to home, since 2018, George Soros has made Virginia a priority. And this is mostly in the northern Virginia area. But he has his so-called Trojan horse candidates have been sent into all those areas. And they've taken them over, apparently. Fairfax, Arlington, Alexandria, Albemarle. Well, that's not even Northern Virginia. I know where that is. That's Charlottesville. Portsmouth and Loudoun. So if you live in any of those counties, did you have any idea that George Soros had sent in one of his Trojan horse prosecutors into your county? And really, that's not all that far away from, from West Virginia. So you need to start paying attention to the prosecutor races and at least educate yourself as to who's running and what is their political party. Because if they they don't have to have a political party, you could have a person running for prosecutor who was registered as an independent. But where they have a political party selected, logically, why not look at the party's platform? Because aren't they adopting the party's platform by adopting that, that political party? And so in all of these um, areas that we're talking about, we're talking about Democrat prosecutors. So on with me today is a Republican prosecutor or Republican lawyer who's running for prosecutor in a county here in West Virginia that has been in the news recently but his, that has had the same Democrat prosecutor run unopposed, at least for the last 10 years, and who I believe has been in office there for a long, long time since the 1980s. So while there is a huge wave of change in West Virginia counties, and they're flipping red, all these old Democrat um, counties full of Democrat politicians are all flipping. They're all flipping to red. Greenbrier County flipped to red. I believe Pocahontas County flipped to red. And I'm sure there's a list of, of more of them. So where you have problems happening, you know, not only follow the money, but follow the political parties. So let me bring um, Ben on, see if it works here. Hey, Ben, can you hear me? Sure can, John. Okay. All right, sorry about the technical difficulties there. That's okay. I think uh, it might have been a little bit on my end. I was trying to open the link uh, in the Messenger app instead of actually copying it and opening it in Safari. So um, that my apologies. But thanks for having me on. Sure. Let me let me see if this is the best way to. Nope, not like that. Yeah, we can do that. Make our heads a little smaller for a few minutes. <laughs> kind of hate staring at just the the big the big faces right there. So you are running for prosecuting attorney in Raleigh County, uh, West Virginia, right? Absolutely. And you've already, so you've already finished the, the primary race and now you're into the general election. I'll tell you, we, we finished the primary out and, and we finished strong and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, my opponent has been in, in office for a while. 
um, at least uh, to the extent that she's never had an actual opponent in any election for which she's ran. Um, she's been in that office at least in an assistant prosecutor capacity uh, since 1983. Um, so we've, we've had quite a bit of, of that administration and that way of prosecuting. Um, we both had unopposed primaries. I'm the first person that's ever decided to run against her. As a matter of fact, I used to be uh, one of her assistant prosecutors. I left uh, to take a job doing civil litigation, um, you know, in hopes of eventually running for office. And that's what I decided to do at first chance. So we both had unopposed primaries. And just as you were speaking about counties flipping red, um, Raleigh County's Republicans showed out pretty well. I believe I was uh, less than 10 votes shy of having a quadruple digit uh, lead in raw votes. And what I mean by raw votes is since she had an unopposed primary and I had an unopposed primary, that that raw vote total in my primary versus the raw vote total in hers. Um, I believe that I was nearly a thousand votes ahead. Um, so I'm hoping this November um, and even in the early voting uh, weeks in October, if we have the same turnout and the same people and we can get some party line voting, uh, that things are going to turn out uh, in a pretty good direction for us. Um, so we're we're giving it our best chance. I was with Paris Dunford of, of WVNS earlier today. I'm going to be on the WJ, WJLS family and networks uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, so this is this is the media tour, so to speak, before early voting. So you were an assistant prosecutor, assistant prosecuting attorney, excuse me, assistant prosecuting attorney in this in this county that you're running running in now. Is that right? Yes, I was. I took that role uh, in January of 2017 and I left that role uh, in September of 2018. So I think roughly 19 months. Um, just to get to get right to the point, I, I don't think a lot of people even realize that the prosecutor races are partisan races, whereas the, the judicial races, they're all nonpartisan. So there's no Democrat judge anymore. There's no Republican judge running, even though they we may know who they are from the past. The, they don't have any official designation anymore. But the prosecutor races are political uh, affiliated races. And I was just looking at your opponent's Facebook page for her campaign. And she was complaining on there that she wished that the legislature had made the prosecutor races to be nonpartisan, just like the judges and, and, and kind of complaining that there shouldn't be any politics involved in being a prosecutor. My, my immediate response to that is, well, obviously she's a Democrat because she doesn't want anybody to know her, her political affiliation. But secondly, if you don't have any politics and you, you don't want to, if you don't want any politics involved in your, in your campaign, I mean, you could be an independent, could you not? You absolutely could. Um, you could be an independent or you could be a member of, of one of the uh, third parties that are on the West Virginia ticket. You know, here, here's my, um, my response to that is, is generally the legislature always has this bill pending. It, it usually comes up trying to make the prosecutor's office a nonpartisan race, just like they did with magistrates and judges um, within the last 10 years. You know, now magistrates, it used to be a plurality vote where, say, in Raleigh County, where we have five seats, you put everyone on the ballot, top five get in. Now there's divisions, so you pick a specific magistrate you want to run against, and also, um, and so those political parties come through. I believe in Raleigh County, uh, because voter registration is public, and you can find that out, the Raleigh County magistrates um, have all switched their party from Democrat to Independent um, for that very reason, because they don't want to scare off any voters uh, when it comes time for, for you know, as educated voters to look up what their what their party affiliation is. Um, my response to saying politics has no place in prosecution is, uh, I think it's absurd because I think politics are certainly where you stand on issues, define who you are, and they define 
the discretion with which you'll you'll discharge your duties as the prosecuting attorney and as the chief law enforcement officer uh, of that county. Um, so, you know, if I'm looking at an issue uh, involving a Castle Doctrine case or involving, um, you know, some sort of, of, of Second Amendment right, uh, I'm looking at it through a different lens. Uh, so we're all human. Um, and, and yes, I am required to apply the law as written by our state legislature, by the U.S. Constitution, any applicable federal law. But in exercising my discretion, of course, uh, there are going to be different opinions between different prosecutors that belong to different party platforms. Right. So the, the law says what it says, but... You know, they don't we don't have what fifty five different state courthouses around this state and then however many federal courthouses and however however many magistrate courthouses around this state just to apply the law because we have disputes of fact. And and um the the discretion of a prosecutor of whether you know the, the way they see the facts and whether or not you know, they want to bring the charges or proceed with the charges. I mean, it's a huge amount of power. And if you, if your motivation is social justice and social change, just a, a general example, you might come to one decision about whether or not to proceed with a prosecution. And if your if your uh, ideological viewpoint is one of the constitutional protections or individual liberty, you know, natural rights, things like that, um, a conservative point of view or a Republican point of view, then you, you're going to make or you probably will make a very much different decision on whether to charge a particular case. Now, what, what really kind of gets me is the prosecutors that you see in some of these cities, and it's just such obvious um, political influence in their decisions. You know, for instance, in, in Baltimore, when, when they, you know, char charged all of these police officers that were, was involved, I can't remember which death that was, but the guy who was in the van, they, you know, even, even the ones that there really wasn't, there was no case against as far as, I mean, there may have been a civil case, but there was no felony criminal case against them and everybody knew it, but she just did it because that's what the mob wanted. And, that ended in, I think it was an acquittal in pretty much every case. And it, it just makes me so mad because the, the role of the prosecutor, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the role of the prosecutor is not just to win or to get convictions, it's to see that justice is done. Yeah, I, and you know, I couldn't agree more. As a matter of fact, I think we have um, a compelling ethical duty to seek justice and not seek convictions. Um, you know, specifically in cases where we don't believe evidence supports um, charging a crime. Uh, to go back just briefly to touch on what you talked about with, with you know, 55 different courthouses and in and, and those different political proclivities in, in charging crime. You know, in West Virginia, I can tell you, I've been in jurisdictions where they won't, they won't prosecute a marijuana case anymore. Uh, it's on the books. You're not allowed to have marijuana. Um, but unless you have a a compelling amount of marijuana, and we're talking pounds, um, the prosecutors in different jurisdictions won't prosecute it at all. There are prosecutors that see it, that take the kind of the broken windows approach, which is, you know, if you let that go, what else are, are we going to let go? And what else are we going to open the doors to? Uh, so they will still prosecute marijuana crimes. Um, again, these are these prevailing political issues that are playing out in the prosecutor's office and in the executive branch. Um, so, no, it's not as simple as apply the law as written. Just as you said, I think most lawyers would be out of a job if it was apply the law as written, because even the law as written is open to interpretation in, in you know, most instances. You know, how does it apply to the facts that are at hand? Um, you know, and, and the biggest mistake prosecutors can make is coming into it with this mentality that the day I'm elected, or at least the day that I'm sworn in, my next campaign starts today. 
Um, it's, it's not that. It's not a public appeasement and to do an episiotomy on the legal system. Um, it's to seek justice and whatever that looks like um, has to be the unfortunate circumstance that might surround your public office. Um, we are subject to public review in, in West Virginia every four years. Um, so, you know, there, it, it might be unpopular, but I think we have a compelling ethical duty to seek justice and not to necessarily appease the public. It, it's interesting, you know, having done quite a bit of, of criminal defense myself, the dynamic that the prosecutor plays in it and being people who are elected, the biggest factor a lot of times that I've seen is whether or not the victim or the alleged victim or the victim's family in the case are essentially camped out on the prosecutor's office doorstep. Those cases where they're, they're, they're just on the prosecutor as if they're their personal lawyer or something like that, but they're on the prosecutor to, to prosecute, to prosecute, to put somebody in prison, um, whatever the case may be. That's such a big driving factor in my experience and what kind of result you, you, you get in a, in a criminal case, whether or not you're able to work something out or whether you're, you're headed to a trial. So, you know, I don't think there's any perfect system out there, but I think it is important that a prosecutor has the, has the, uh, I don't know, the strength of, of conviction to always do what they think is right and what, what is justice rather than, you know, just sort of act like the, the victim's lawyer to try to get them the restitution that they're asking for. So, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, it's not that far off from a, a family court judge sometimes where you, 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 it's kind of a lose, lose, you know, you, you, you're not going to make the, the, the aggressive victims perfectly happy necessarily. And then you're not going to make the, you know, the, the other side happy because you're, you're end up, you, you, you don't have control over them. So you're doing what you think is right. And you may end up, you know, somewhere in between, but I think that that can be a, a difficult job. And, sure. you know, I, that's why I think that the, the, the ideological outlook on things, I mean, it, it definitely can play a part, you know, that, you know, are, is somebody politically a law and order type, you know, are they, are they, um, are they not a law and order type, you know, it, you know, it you never know. And you don't always know just from Republican or Democrat either. Well, and what I would say to that is there's, there's a couple of different, there's a lot of, there's onion like layers in what, you know, what you just said. And one of them is I, I'm always guided by the principle of every single decision you make, try to do the right thing in that decision. If you're guided by that and you're trying to do the right thing in that decision, um, it, it doesn't matter if you make people happy or not. Um, again, the system isn't always going to make people happy because there's, there's too many varying interests. Um, you know, what I will say is it's, it's scary that we have a system on one hand where certain victims have to, to feel the need to uh, approach attorneys, approach various victim advocacy groups like the Women's Resource Center or um, Just for Kids or whatever the, uh, the advocacy group is in order to have themselves heard. Uh, they feel like if I don't have one of those groups or, or one of those professionals with me, I'm not going to be taken as seriously and maybe my case falls through the cracks. I've been a victim advocate as recently as, as last week, even here in this county. Um, a friend of mine had approached me about just not being, not feeling like they were heard uh, in, a, in a case in which they were the victim. Um, so I didn't go demanding results. But I did go to, to gather information and to better explain the legal process for them. Um, and I just feel like that I, I feel sad for those people that those victims that don't have someone uh, on their side and don't have someone willing to do that. Um, so I don't feel like there's equal access to justice uh, in, in that respect. Kind of on the, you know, the, the counterpunch to that, though, is. 
I do believe those those cases where you have a camping out victim, so to speak, uh, can lead to that case being more uh, difficult to handle because you'll have a prosecutor that wants to uh, appease maybe that victim in that case that even in some cases wants a um, wants an unreasonable result. Um, it'll be a little more difficult to handle. And I can tell you, I've been in magistrate courts when I was a criminal defense attorney in which the prosecutor would say, you know, no, can't do this. Uh, victim wants, wants the other thing. And I'll say, well, no, look, you, your job is to look at the law, look at the facts and circumstances, look at the totality of this case and come up with what you think is the fair result. Your ethical duty to the victim is to keep them informed, to notify them of court dates, to notify them of process, and, and to, to keep them abreast of, of developments. Uh, but the prosecutor's office is not an office that represents an individual victim in an attorney-client capacity. Um, you know, and, and I'll find prosecutors that approach it almost like that's the case. And it's just, it's not. Um, we had a visitor here, Barry Goldwater. I don't, I don't know if you can see any of the comments pop up. I'll put I, up I on the screen oh, there. Yeah. He, had, he had a question. How does he feel? And I'm sorry, there, there were a lot more questions than this, but this, but when I saw that we had Barry Goldwater on here, I, I had to see what his question was. How, how do you feel about the war on drugs in general? Um, Fentanyl has torn up McDowell County, and I wonder if it's safer, cleaner access wouldn't at least cut down on the overdoses. Do you have a, a response safer, to that? Safer and cleaner access. I, I mean, if he if he is talking about maybe like a, uh, a safe use site uh, they have in some urban areas, um, I can endorse a safe use site. I understand uh, the war on drugs is, has been ill fought in, in, in a lot of different attempts. I'll give you one for example here in Southern West Virginia. Southern West Virginia first tackled our opioid epidemic uh, by trying to eradicate the uh, overprescribing and um, misuse of prescription opioid uh, pills, Oxycontin, Roxycontin, those types of things. And it tried to do that through um, going after doctors, pharmacies, and those types of medical professionals that were dispensing uh, uh, these drugs. I think we did a very good job in terms of law enforcement of taking pills out of the equation. The problem is, just like your, uh, your viewer pointed out, um, you know, we now have heroin that's moved in and it's moved in at an extreme and rapid pace. And with heroin, when he's talking about fentanyl, you know, fentanyl gets its way into uh, the drug user's hands, typically through heroin. We're not talking medical grade fentanyl. We're talking raw fentanyl used as a cutting agent or an additive for inventory control of heroin. Um, so when fentanyl is decimated a community, we're talking about heroin usage primarily. Um, the problem is we haven't adequately tackled the demand we've tackled the supply but as long as there's a demand the supply will come and, and it's came in droves so what we need to look at is true possession crimes so in other words those crimes that um those crimes that are looked at as non-property crime non-violent crime simple drug possession we need to look at what kind of community corrections and and medical uh residential rehabilitation alternatives we have to try to influence this in the community so i always talk about in a lot of my campaign um, literature and a lot of my campaign uh, appearances about being reactionary to crime instead of uh, preventative one thing we need to do is get on board with the fact that the, the mass incarceration of everyone um, i'm a crime and punishment guy but the mass incarceration of everyone is not going to cut it with the with the drug problem. Uh, that being said, uh, if you are infringing upon the rights of others and you're doing it in a repetitive way, so those people that are part of what I call the revolving door of our system, they're in and out all the time. Um, they are multiple time offenders. Uh, we need to look at their incarceration. Yeah, Rick uh, Janney from Facebook 
said that Southern West Virginia Crime Watch, and there's 4,500 members, support and endorse Ben Hatfield simply because we're tired of the catch and release that's going on and poisoning our county. We need a change. We have seen her track record, referring to his opponent. We've seen the huge variances of magistrate bail favors, and it's not been good. Our county is poisoned by crime and drugs. We want a prosecutor that will help cl clearly establish our Castle Doctrine protections. Well, there's a couple different topics there, but I'll point out that on re regarding the, the bail issue, somebody had just sent me, maybe that's who, who, who sent it to me, a, a couple examples just this week of disparate bail out of Raleigh County. So two guys charged with the same thing. And the, the, the bail was just, and, and maybe same number of counts, and the bail was just wildly different. And one of them had, I think the guy from out of state had lower bail than the one who is from in-state. And just looking at, maybe there was there was more to it, but it seems like there's something going on there with with, with the bail situation. I, I don't know, is it? I'll is, tell you what, it doesn't surprise me, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is, this is one of my favorite topics with regard to Lolly County criminal justice. And it's because the way that it's been looked at for a very long period of time, even when I was defending crime, is if you could get someone from out of state out of jail, whether it be on on bail um, uh, or whatever method of pretrial release you're going to use, whether it be a surety bond or a cash bail, um, if you could get them out, then you knew they weren't going to be pursued very vehemently because uh, the hope would be that they just go out of state and, and stay, just leave the state and stay. Well, the problem is, is that might solve the in the micro. So in other words, that offender's gone and, and you've solved your problem in the micro. But your macro, so your larger picture, is that this state in this county then gets this reputation that you can go and commit your crime and as long as you get out of jail. Uh, you'll never really face ultimate consequences. We see that in extradition parameters. And I know you were talking about, um, or at least you were, you were going to talk about it at one various point, the Rittenhouse case, and that young man's facing extradition from Illinois. Um, but the, not to get off on that side tangent, but so we, dis, we define when we enter a warrant, if someone doesn't appear for court, say they're out of state, they bond out, and then their court date comes up and they don't show. We get a bench warrant or a capious warrant uh, for their arrest. And we enter that into a national database. Okay. A lot of people just refer to it as NCIC. Okay. When that person is contacted by law enforcement in another jurisdiction, it's out of state, say it's Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, whatever, that officer is going to see extradition parameters. So in other words, the requesting jurisdiction, Raleigh County, West Virginia, will extradite this individual under what circumstances? So it'll either be in-state only, it'll be surrounding states only, it'll be east of the Mississippi, uh, or it may be the entire, or contiguous U.S., or maybe the entire U.S. Um, so uh, it's, it's long since been a practice in Raleigh County for those extradition parameters just to put up this this invisible wall with a wink saying don't come back to west virginia which will be in-state only extradition with a wink saying please stay in ohio stay in virginia stay in pennsylvania or wherever you are and you know it's 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 time that changes because what we've said is we're open for criminal business here in raleigh county uh and that has to change so if, as far as that policy, do you, do you think that that policy is coming from your opponent in Raleigh County? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as the, as the chief law enforcement officer of the county, I mean, that's when you get hired on there, that's kind of how you're taught to do it, which is, you know, put up that virtual wall and uh, don't extradite anyone that's going to cost us uh, too much money um, because we don't want them back. But the problem is it, it doesn't cut it because we're, we're now a moving target for criminals to come into our area and, uh, and commit crime. I got to say just from somebody who lives like an hour and 15 minutes away, 
I've driven through Beckley many times. I haven't practiced a whole lot of law there, but I, I've, I've been there plenty. And I got to say, I, I travel all over the state of West Virginia now, especially with just having my cases spread out all over the state. I think that I feel like the most dangerous place that I go is, is Beckley. I'm not even gonna say Raleigh County because I, you know, it, it's only in the, in the city of Beckley. It's like, that's, I, I hear about, I mean, it's rare that you hear about, you know, murders or homicides, all, these, these sorts of, this sort of stuff in West Virginia, it really doesn't, doesn't happen here across most of the state. But like the one exception to that, in my mind, and I can't even really think of another exception. Of course, you have the problems down in McDowell County um, and maybe Mingo County, Logan County. You have, I mean, you have random stuff that happens like a murdered sheriff, things like that. But there's usually more to the story. But just as far as just crime danger, like you'd find in a big city somewhere, Beckley is, is I mean, it seems like it's the only place in West Virginia, well, maybe Huntington maybe Huntington, but, uh, but, but Beckley is definitely up there. I don't know what the statistics are, but if you're, if you're, your challenger or the, the incumbent has been there and has been the chief law enforcement officer for a long time, just from the outside looking in. And I, I do know a little bit about the criminal justice system. It seems like something is off in that place. Something is off. You know, I, yep. it, and, and what, what I'll tell you is it, it, is because we're major drug trafficking areas. Uh, you mentioned Huntington, you mentioned Beckley. If you look at Beckley uh, on a map with roads on an overlay, it's almost a crosshairs. We got 77 uh, coming from uh, Charlotte. We have 64 going east to west. Um, we are a major drug trafficking area. Uh, I will tell you, I used to work with the guys on the Beckley Raleigh County Drug and Violent Crime Unit. Um, they're doing the best they can, but if they would be honest and, and I don't want to put any one individual, one of them uh, on an Island, um, if they, if they were being honest, a lot of their cases or their major cases get taken to the United States attorney's office now, uh, because that office, uh, the U S attorney, uh, my steward, that office has some teeth. Um, our office is not viewed at as an office that has teeth on drug crime. Um, it's it's just not so because of why that, not i mean why help, help me why, why not what motivation is there to to it's it stemmed from the jail bill um you know pre-trial incarceration is an obligation of the counties to pay even for major felony crime uh it's an obligation of counties and it's a line item on the county commission's uh, annual budget um so what happens is this office, you know, the Raleigh County Prosecuting Attorney's Office has basically told that task force, don't arrest anyone, don't do any more drug roundups. I think, you know, back in the, you know, early, early last decade, early this decade, rather, uh, you used to see where they would serve, you know, 75 to 80 warrants at a time for those those individuals that were uh, going ahead and, and, and distributing narcotics. Now they don't do that. They'll present them what we call straight to the grand jury. So in other words, in lieu of arrest, they'll present their case to the grand jury. And then those drug traffic or drug traffickers will appear at their arraignment post grand jury um, and will be able to post their bond without ever have to ever having to be arrested. They'll get processed at the courthouse. So they'll get fingerprinted and, and things of that nature. But essentially someone who's engaging in multiple counts in, in most instances of trafficking heroin, methamphetamine, um, and then also heroin containing fentanyl, car fentanyl, all the, all the terrible bad stuff, um, is never actually facing an initial arrest. Um, and then those individuals that are out of state never in fact ever come back for their grand jury process. And then we face that extradition issue that we talked about which is well if we if we put up this virtual fence maybe they'll never come back well the problem is with a with a um, with a very strong drug network the the next person they send back won't be the same person they sent before anyway so 
it's 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 an entire systemic problem with how we prosecute drug crime uh, in this county and i'd like to change that um this guy jimmy touchdown off of youtube has a question and that's that's why i like i love being the being able to live stream to you to youtube and to facebook because on youtube you get all sorts of crazy names you have no idea who the hell you're talking to like misplaced hillbilly but he he has he always has good questions and obviously uh what was his name barry goldwater but we have jimmy touchdown here but he says prosecuting attorneys suck up to the police union possess immunity and have little oversight how are you any different i i think that's actually a really good question uh, and i was looking at your opponent's facebook site and she basically said, I, I don't want to in, have anything to do with social media because she's she's afraid of of people coming after her for what she's done it, it, on on her job. In any event, she lists people who have endorsed her. And it looked to me basically be unions. We had the, the fire department union. I'm not sure why the fire department union necessarily takes a position there, but but they're a union. And I think she said maybe the the FOP. So, I mean, it looked to me just from looking at her site that the the police union is endorsing her. And so, let me get you to to address that, and I'll get to the to the immunity thing. I can rant about immunity all day long, but just regarding um, the police union, are they supporting your opponent, or, or are they also supporting you, if that's possible? And if not, is there a difference between that and you know, the, the majority of the police officers in that jurisdiction that you encounter. Sure. And, and that's, that's a, uh, that's a hearty topic. So yes, the police unions are uh, in, endorsing her, the West Virginia um, Troopers Association, the state deputy sheriff's association and the fraternal order of police. So that is both state um, deputies, so, uh, the state deputies association and the local fraternal order of the police, Black Diamond Lodge. Uh, have all supported her. Uh, I will tell you that the initial idea that I got to, to run for office was from some of the B cops that I used to work with um, dealing with cases when I was an assistant prosecutor. So I don't know that that, that truly reflects the average everyday officer here in Raleigh County. I at least have had a number of people um, that work in that field reach out to me in support. That being said, I'm not subservient to those unions, I believe, um, and I've even done so with collegiality and, and respect, but I believe part of my job as a prosecuting attorney's office is holding law enforcement accountable when they need to be held accountable, um, educating them when they need to be educated on things that I would need on the adjudicatory side of law enforcement uh, in order to make cases stick. Um, there's two sides of law enforcement and I always joke it. It's like the one thing TV got right. You know, there's, there's two separate uh, groups that, that represent the people. There's the police that investigate crime, but there's also prosecuting attorneys that, that adjudicate it and the, you know, prosecute the offenders. So, you know, things I need in my adjudicatory uh, tool belt, I need to maybe educate officers on. Um, another way that I'm different is transparency. Um, I have a litany of ways that the public can contact me for comment. Now, I know I'm not in office yet, but that won't change if I get elected. Um, there'll be, I will have, uh, the, the members of this community will have access to me. Um, they have access to who my, my donors are. They have access to who my supporters are. And, you know, what I would say about that is, I'm not beholden to any group or to any individual. Um, my job is to take the law, apply it, apply it with the principles that I hold w with myself as an individual and those that I would like you know, my community to reflect. And if that happens to uh, offend anyone or make anyone angry in a, in a particular instance, I'll be sorry, but it won't affect my, it won't affect my decision-making ability. Yeah, I mean, I think generally in West Virginia, you look at any any political race and you look at the Democrat candidate and the the biggest donors to their campaign is you just name the unions. You got the, 
the police union, the fire department union, the carpenters union, the steel workers union. I mean, they're, they're, we're supporting Democrats and you're the Republican nominee, but, you know, which, I, is, which is strange for me because, you know, I think if you look at the national climate, um, you know, specifically the national climate, you'll find that your pro law enforcement, your pro law and order candidates, um, are not on the democratic ticket. Uh, that's, I, I would say that that's for sure. Um, now, do I think that individuals have civil rights and civil liberties that need to be protected? Absolutely. That's what the Constitution's for. But do I believe that, that law enforcement need the ability to do their job and to do it effectively? I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, Jimmy Touchdown also asked, how many cops have you prosecuted in your entire career? Well, he he's in he's a civil litigation lawyer right now. But when you were a oh, we lost him. No, you're back. When you were a, an assistant prosecutor, did you ever have any cases where you were prosecuting hey, John. police officers? Shoot. Oh, maybe we lost him here. All right, I'll give him a chance to to uh, get back on. I'm not sure. I can't answer that question for him, obviously. Let's see. Let's see. Um, Barry, what, what do you think about George Soros donating funding to local candidates? Now, Barry, are you aware of any West Virginia candidates that George Soros has donated to? If you do put it up because I, I'd like to know, I, I, I don't see how, uh, the only ones I found were in Virginia, again, those counties that I already mentioned. I don't know if, if, if we can bring them back up here or not. Can you hear me, Ben? Can you hear me? And now I can. Uh, I received a phone call. I had my okay, there you are. AirPods in. And when I received the phone call, um, I, it just messed up the audio. Uh, I'll go That's back. To right. the last, I'll go back to the last question because I, I don't want to be unfair to the individual that asked it. I don't remember who asked that it uh, asked it rather. It um, how many cops have I prosecuted in my entire career? Um, you know, as an assistant prosecutor, I didn't handle any law enforcement cases. We had uh, a case where a law enforcement officer was accused of uh, drug trafficking. Uh, that was handled by another assistant prosecutor in in the office. Um, but in my 19 months, which is, you know, relatively brief time, a year and a half, uh, I didn't have any, any cases directly against law enforcement. I, let me, I'll tell you a story real quick. Um, I went to a, a prosecutor one time is I had, I had a guy that came to me and he complained that he was beaten by a police officer. And it was basically a, a drunken public sort of deal. They show up, the guy's drunk. And he ends up getting some road rash on his face sort of deal. And a witness comes forward and the witness didn't know the guy, but the witness just happened to be coming out of some bar and it was late at night and witnessed what happened and had contacted me, didn't know this guy, but found out that I was representing him and, and told me the story of what like he and his friend had witnessed. And he was kind of afraid to, to come forward. And so I said, well, look, if I go to, you know, I'll just go straight to the prosecutor's office and I'll, I'll let them, you know, I'll let them know about it. You don't have to be worried about, about coming forward or retaliation or anything like that. So I contacted the prosecutor and I said, look, I, I, there, there have been these allegations and I really think that you need to hear about this. And so if I get the person to come in, you know, will you meet with this person and, and I'll be there as well and just hear their story of what they saw, what happened. And again, he wasn't related or had never met my client. And so I get this person to come and we go to the prosecutor's office and we get ushered into the conference room to, to meet with the prosecutor and, and, and my clients with me and the witnesses there. And I don't even know if my client was maybe, but, but the witness was there and who had been scared to come forward. And as we walk into the conference room, yeah, the prosecutor is there, but sitting right next to him 
is the police officer that this guy had told the story about that he, he, the witness had seen that this particular police officer do what he was describing as basically unnecessary and excessive force. And so then we sat down and, you know, the prosecutor is like, so, you know, what, Mr. Witness, what did you see? And the witness is like, um, you know, I, I completely forgot. I don't recall. And that was the end. Of, that was basic. And well, it wasn't even the end of the meeting because then the prosecutor was like, well, did you see anything? No, no, I didn't see anything. Did, did, did you see? I mean, did you see anything improper? No, no, no. Everything looked fine to me. So it actually went the other way. And I realized, uh, I guess I learned a lesson at that point that, you know, you have to be careful who you trust. And, you know, it, what would you, so I think it's, it's important for there to be some measure of independence between the prosecutor or the prosecutor's office and, and the police officers on the street or investigating a case. If you receive some sort of information or allegation that there, there was a civil rights violation or, you know, just an unnecessary and excessive use of force, something like that, somebody came forward. I mean, what, what would your point of view be? Um, I mean, would you, I'm not asking you to specifically address that situation, but it seems to me to be an important thing. There needs to be some independence there. And his question was, have you ever prosecuted any cops? But I guess the the better question really is, would you, you know, you, if you're working with these people and, and you, you do get evidence that something had happened is, would you, would you take that and do something with it? Or would you do what probably Jimmy touched down his experience before and, and, and just sort of cover it up or, or just leave it where it is? No, look, you, you got to realize that, um, you know, while I am running to be the chief law enforcement officer of the county, that doesn't mean I'm beholden um, to every law enforcement officer. If, if a law enforcement officer commits a crime, uh, in my jurisdiction, I will investigate it. And if I have the evidence, I will prosecute the crime. Now, do I think police criminal activity is a rampant problem here in Raleigh County? I, I don't think that's the case. Do I think that it's happened before? Well, probably. Um, so I guess my my answer is absolutely. I, I would prosecute a law enforcement officer if I believe they committed a crime and I had evidence of that crime. That's, that's hands down. That's easy. Here, here's a question just popped up. Tommy Carter, <clears throat> what is your thoughts? Do you think that certain current lawyers or donors that promote the current Raleigh County DA, and it's, it's prosecuting attorney in West Virginia, not DA, mm. where I worked in North Carolina, they, they were DAs, um, or should receive certain nepotism privileges throughout cases? Thanks for your time. I, maybe you understand um, what he's asking, but I, I, I think, think he's asking. I think, I think he's probably referring to if a lawyer has donated to to a prosecutor, uh, should they receive favor in their cases? And the, the answer is that absolutely not. As a matter of fact, I would say that if I didn't believe that I could hold myself accountable and neutral with regard to that individual lawyer's support, uh, I should recuse myself from any case in which I'm going to be going up against that lawyer. Um, now, I believe that that both my opponent and myself uh, can make that decision. So in other words, I don't think that's a per se, um, I don't believe that a per se disqualification, uh, but I will say that it should absolutely play no factor uh, in in whether or not that lawyer gets, gets favoritism. Um, and I believe if I know where this is going, um, uh, my opponent uh, got a pretty hefty donation from a criminal defense lawyer uh, here in town. I think it was a, a $2,000 donation from one of the criminal defense lawyers. Um, I believe that's where that's going. And um, th is it that lawyer's right to give that money? Yes, because it's, it's underneath the individual uh, limitation. Um, is it my opponent's right to accept it? Absolutely. Um, but if it was to ever cross a line and start uh, start meaning that favoritism was being played with regard to, to that individual attorney, I believe that would be improper. 
the the attorney that you're talking about, I mean, do you, it, is is that the same guy, the same lawyer? Then you don't have to answer this if if you don't want to. Is that the same lawyer that is in the 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 video from the the family court judge who searched my client's house? I believe it's the same lawyer, and that's kind of all I'll go into on that that issue. But I believe it is the same lawyer. So, as far as your opponent and that lawyer um, who who's shall not be named at this point. They've both been around there in that Raleigh County system for a long time, I take it. Yeah, a very long time. Um, I'm not sure when that attorney received a bar license, but I would be willing to say it would, it would probably be in the 80s. All right. Let's see. Let, let me, there's other questions, but let me, let me get to my most important concern when it comes to prosecutors. And like, like I had told you, I wanted to discuss, you know, your thoughts on the, on the Rittenhouse case, but so the second amendment and gun rights, because that's, I think that's where you might see the biggest difference between a Democrat prosecutor and a Republican prosecutor, because I mean, hell you see dramatic differences between Supreme court justices when it comes to the second amendment. I mean, we have what two or three Supreme court justices right now who take the position that there is no individual right to, to bear arms under the second amendment, that it refers to a militia that doesn't exist anymore. And then you have a majority, thankfully on the court right now that believes that there is an individual right to bear arms under the second amendment but has not extended that at this point beyond the home and really beyond just pistols rather than something like AR-15s. So there's definitely going to be, so it, that is an important distinction between Republicans and Democrats usually. Now, I don't know how your opponent feels on that, but as far as, as far as your thoughts, I mean, what are your, what's your position on second amendment rights and, and, you know, prosecuting or not prosecuting cases involving, you know, self-defense and firearms. Um, I'm, I'm pro second amendment's applicability to an individual human being. I believe it is our second amendment, second amendment right to possess and to carry firearms. Uh, I will say this. Um, with regard to self-defense cases involving weapons, uh, I then believe uh, that it it relies um, on the individual person claiming that affirmative defense's mindset at the time they use that firearm. Uh, I do not believe that the Second Amendment gives you a right to defend property with deadly force. Um, I, I will not say that, but uh, if you can articulate and prove that that your uh, discharging that firearm was in reasonable fear for your life or for the life and safety of others. So in other words, a defense of others case or a self-defense case, um, then then I will I will gladly look at that and and calculate that into uh, my decision as to whether or not to prosecute that individual. Yeah, for instance, like I I talked to somebody, you know, that in a particular county that was involved in a situation with sort of a home intruder type deal. And it involved, it wasn't a shooting, but it involved the homeowner being armed and basically chasing the person off with a, with a firearm. And there, there, there was concern in the, in the particular County that we're talking about because the elected prosecutor in that County a Democrat is has been well known for being anti-gun and anti-use of, of deadly force using firearms in period and and just has as a bad you know track record for it. So it, what you're saying is I mean you support the second amendment and as long as it's a use of deadly force to protect a life, your life or some other individual's life, then you absolutely would support, you know, the, the, 
the uh, self-defense scenario, but you're not going to extend that to property because obviously that's not West Virginia law at this. Sure. Point. Sure. And, and you know, what I would, what I would say to that particular instance is could that, that individual who is chasing someone away from their home, um, feel that, that they were chasing the person away until they felt safe. Absolutely. I wouldn't charge that person under that scenario with, with any crime. As a matter of fact, I think they did what was, what was well within their rights to do. Um, what I'm, I'm referring to is, you know, someone that under that scenario would have shot someone fleeing uh, from their home without that person possessing a firearm or firing back or, or anything like that. Someone that they merely found an intruder, chased them out, the person's fleeing, and then they shot them while that person was in a tree. Uh, that's where my decision would flip because they are, they are then uh, not engaging in self-defense or defense of others at that point. So let's let's look at the the McCloskey situation in St. Louis. And I think everybody knows knows sort of what what happened with with the McCloskeys, but what what should people do just to, just in your opinion if you know if there if there's for instance somebody breaking into their into their car or causing some sort of problem outside their house now they can just lock the door and stay in their house or well, they could they could go outside and confront the person armed with a firearm so those are those are two different very different choices and I don't know that there's there's ever a great a perfect answer to what you do in in that situation. Well, I'll but say this: the, the 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 McCloskey situation is a little bit different because of of the numbers of people. So it wasn't one person potentially intruding or trespassing. Uh, it was a number of people, um, and I apologize for not being as versed on the specific facts i know at one point um there was talk that the protesters had came in a gate that was being held open there was some evidence that they had twisted and mangled the gate um but regardless i think even the protesters themselves have acquiesced in the fact that uh, they were trespassing um, so they've, they're at least admitted to it or, or been silent and admitted by silence by admission. Um, so, you know, that is different because I think that an individual can articulate a reasonable fear uh, in that in that particular instance of uh, fear for their safety and fear for the safety of their spouse in that particular instance. So. You know? Yeah, I think in the in the McCloskey case, I I believe that it was heard, you know, people saying burn it down, burn it down as far as far as their house. So yeah. so yeah, I think it's different than just you know the one guy outside your house breaking into your car or something and you, and you come out as opposed to a mob of people that already has burnt that have burnt buildings down and they they've entered your neighborhood They've targeted your house. And yeah, I mean, I think that it becomes a tactical question. Do you stay inside, lock the doors and look through the windows? Or do you kind of make a, a show of force outside just by presenting your firearms, not pointing them, but just showing them that you're armed? I mean, they survived the encounter and their home survived not being burnt down. So I think from a tactical point of view, they did something right. Now, the, I think in the, the entire reason kind of we're having this discussion is what was the worst, and this is my opinion, but what was the worst thing that they did? The bad decision, the poor choice that they made was being in a jurisdiction with a leftist Democrat prosecutor because that's why they got charged for that reason. And you even heard the, I think, it, I don't know if it was the governor or the attorney general of Missouri saying that they didn't agree with the charges and the, and the governor was going to um, pardon them or whatever the terminology is over there. But I think that is the, the poor decision that they made is being somewhere where they couldn't trust their prosecutor's office to stand behind them and instead to try to appease a political movement 
or try to appease the media and filing charges just purely based on politics. I think that was their that was their poor choice. And that's just one of the re- that shows you how much power and in the discretion a prosecutor has. And you need to know what their politics are. Well, we've and come full circle uh, because, you know, we talked about using prosecutorial discretion not to charge protesters. Uh, but and, and, and that's a prosecutorial proclivity that, that some Democratic prosecutors may have. But they still have the same prosecutorial discretion not to charge the McCloskeys um, in that particular instance as well. So uh, it, it does come down to uh, your feeling as to the climate and your feeling as term, in terms of, of party politics. And then you have the the Rittenhouse case, and it, I don't think it was as as a bad climate and jurisdiction there with the prosecutors in in Kenosha, Wisconsin, like you had have in St. Louis, but you still had a, a situation where the prosecutors, I mean, they filed charges like out of the gate before the investigation was already done. And I, I think anybody being honest about it could see that they they had rushed that, that they were doing it to appease, you know, the, a political movement, but to appease the, the media, to appease one side. And, and um, you know, I don't know, maybe you disagree about that, but the, the, you know, the Rittenhouse shooting, I think it's important because it shows, it's one of the few examples we have, and there's going to be more of, of the use of, of AR-15s in a self-defense or defense of others type scenario when, when we have judges who say it doesn't happen. But it does happen. And you know where you have, such as in West Virginia, AR-15s are legal. They're legal to have in your home for self-defense. They're, they're legal to open carry for self-defense. And uh, you know where where that's legal and where you're legally allowed to be. I, I don't know. I, I think that the the Rittenhouse case is is it opens up all sorts of questions, and it's going to come down to does your prosecutor have some sort of political ideology that's you know anti uh, anti firearms, anti AR fifteen, anti using an AR-15 for self-defense. And, and that's, that's sort of, I think, what's going on in, in uh, Wisconsin with Rittenhouse. And you know, what are your thoughts on it? You know, a couple of things is, one, you mentioned the speed with which uh, charges were, were, were brought in the case. Um, you know, I'll go back. It's, it's important to not be beholden to any one, uh, any organization, uh, any movement. Um, so when you're looking at the speed in which charges are brought, uh, they should never be brought until all uh, the evidence has been reasonably collected and analyzed. That's the only way you know whether or not a crime has been committed. Uh, it must be done with reasonable speed, so you can't delay forever. You're never going to going to have everything that you wish you had, uh, but you need to at least do a proper uh, investigation. That being said, uh, I don't believe there's limitations to self-defense. Um, if, if you are in a legitimate instance where you're defending yourself or, or you're defending others and you are you have a reasonable fear for your life or for the life of another, I don't believe there's limitations to that, whether it be AR-15, handgun, a knife, whatever the case is, I don't believe there's any limitations to that. And um, nor would I prosecute anyone engaging in self-defense that had that reasonable fear. Um, that's that's not that's not the way I view the law on that. Yeah, and that sort of that sort of happened in the McCloskey case as well. I mean, there, there's really no better if if you're going to potentially have to defend yourself with a firearm. I mean, you'd rather ha- you'd rather have an AR-15 than a pistol, and you know, so in the home, that makes sense that you would be using an AR-15 rather than 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 a pistol. But uh, let's see. So, in, in the interesting thing is, is, I have a case at the Fourth Circuit right now that came out of 
Putnam County where my client was walking down the side of a road of the road with an AR-15 strapped on his shoulder and he was headed coyote hunting. And he just got viciously attacked by, by law enforcement. There's, there's a video, you can see it. And, you know, they're still, they're still arguing that if a police officer sees a, a man with an AR-15, even if it's a jurisdiction where AR-15s are legal, which is the case in West Virginia, and even where open carry is legal, of an AR-15 or any other long rifle in West Virginia and where he has no information about who this person is and whether, whether or not he's a prohibited person, they're still arguing that just the presence of an AR-15 because it's the quote weapon of mass murder makes the person suspicious enough to stop and run a criminal background check on him. So I, I think that that, I mean, that's really the official law enforcement position and, and many places such as Putnam County. So, you know, if you if you win and you you deal with any of these issues, then you know I, I I would encourage you anyways to to not take that point of view where you know, you know why would you have an AR-15? Well, you know why not? Because it's 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 the best. You know if I'm going to have a pistol, why not have an AR-15? Now, I mean it's just it's just. Uh, I think it's a developing area of the law because the, the courts haven't developed, haven't dealt with it much. And I, I can tell you that. And, you know, the, the prosecutors, I think, controlling the discretion of what's getting prosecuted and what's not getting prosecuted are, are going to play a big part in that. And that's another reason why I think it's important to look at the, the political affiliation of your prosecutor. Is this somebody who's a, a Democrat who, who adopts the party where the national platform is to confiscate AR-15s and make them all illegal? Or is your, is your prosecutor from the political affiliation that, you know, has, that supports the ownership of the most popular firearm in the country, you know, AR-15 style rifle. So, so to make a long story short, you're, you're cool with, with AR-15s, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. There, there's some other questions here. I think there was a. There was a question about. Yeah, there it is. I think that's that's a that's a good question for prosecutors in West Virginia. Is is you know what is your your position or your view towards asset forfeiture? Now, another friend of mine who uh, is a prosecutor in a different county, we, we've had this discussion privately where, where he, he, he says, look, I, you know, we only do this where it's a legitimate case. We don't, you know, I don't let law enforcement abuse it, that sort of thing. I, I absolutely believe him. But I've seen this abused in counties. Um, I mean, it, it just awful cases where any – and what we're talking about is, you know, any say there's a traffic stop and there's a thousand dollars in cash or three thousand or five thousand dollars in cash, you know, that for instance could be seized and law enforcement or the prosecutor's office could try to to um, to keep that money by doing what's called a civil asset forfeiture. And I mean, it is done in situations like that where there's no crime proven. There's not even drugs found. There's just cash, and they consider cash to be sort of suspicious, potential proof of of dealing drugs. But it's also it also happens in cases where they do find drugs, and they'll 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 keep the you know some of the assets and and sell them or use them. Um, what's your what's your position on that? So the way that civil asset, civil asset forfeiture is done here in Molly County is it usually comes out of cases involving realistically the the drug and violent crime task force that we have um those cases will involve asset forfeiture where drugs was found in combination with guns drugs was found in combination with money or or any permutation of 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 those individual items um i'm okay with with seizing those assets and here's why any any reasonably connected drug organization that's operating here locally um, a way that you can hit them with, um, you know, hit them in the pocketbook is where it hurts them the most. So if you get 
uh, uh, say you know, five to ten thousand dollars in cash, in addition to you know fifty grams of heroin or more, um, you can file a civil asset forfeiture. It's an action in rem, so you're filing that action against that property. And then that individual can essentially show up for a civil trial on that asset forfeiture. Uh, and if they can show some nexus to that property um, and a legitimate means, so by a job, they can show up with uh, an action or, you know, a proof by a W-2, uh, proof by a lotto ticket inheritance, whatever legitimate means, however they pro procure that money, um, then essentially they can they can win that action and get their money back. Oftentimes when you see, you know, a kilo of, of, of heroin and you know, $20,000, you're not going to find a, a, a rational nexus uh, to that person having that money. So I, I believe that asset forfeitures can be used. Now, do they have the potential to be abused? Um, absolutely. Uh, my, my job would be to try to funnel that into those actions that actually need to be filed. Um, I believe that is how you would counteract a, a drug network that's operating in your, in your community, though, is to hit them in that, in that pocketbook to disincentivize and, and to reduce the profits by which they're operating in your county. So I, I do believe it's a valuable tool, uh, but, you know, as anything, what, what, it needs to be, it needs to be um, closely monitored by the figurehead of the organization. And, and that would be me if elected. So the prosecutor has the, the final say as far as who we're going after for civil asset forfeiture. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. So, so the, what if, some, what the, if somebody... Agency, the agency can request it, but ultimately the prosecutor's office is who actually files the, the petition against the property. So what if what if somebody, for instance, is pulled over and they have a few thousand dollars cash in their car and that is that is seized by the police officer who pulls them over and now they're asked to come forward? Well, I, well, I guess let me back you up. Are you would you support a policy of police officers just seizing cash where the only suspicion against the individual is just the presence of the cash? There's no drugs. There's no there's no suspicion that's articulated by the police officer whatsoever. It's just the cash. No. Now, from my point of view, I may have ten thousand dollars cash in my in my in my truck. Maybe I'm going to buy a vehicle. You know, maybe, who knows, maybe I'm going to buy an Airstream. And from my point of view, you know, it's none of that police officer's business where I got it or, or what I do with it unless I commit a crime. Now, that's that's my point of view. What, I mean, what do you, and I think those are sort of the situations that, that get people riled up and where you see some abuse here. So, so what do you think about that? No no articulated suspicions of any criminal conduct. It's just the presence of cash. No, as a matter of fact, I think that's our civil, uh, our civil right to carry cash. Uh, so no, I wouldn't support civil asset forfeiture on that case. Um, I would require the, the suspicion of the commission of, of, of a crime, whether that be a, a gun crime, uh, if it's a prohibited person uh, trafficking in weapons, whether that is a drug crime um, uh, or if if there's some suspicion that that individual engaged in the theft of that cash. But to me, there has to be a, a, an articulable suspicion uh, that a crime has been committed. Cash alone um, is, is not subject to asset forfeiture, just the presence of it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, let me ask you about this. No knock warrants. I had I had a case in the northern in the northern district and, and federal court where I represented an elderly man who basically a, a SWAT team sort of just busted in on him while he's watching TV at night. And make a long story short, they pretty much scared him to death, and he he died right there. He wasn't under arrest for anything. They were looking for somebody else, but they performed a no knock entry. Now they didn't have a no-knock warrant. 
and when I deposed all of these these SWAT team guys, they they none of them had seen a no knock warrant before. They had never asked for one, though they made no knock entries. And I I don't know that I still to this day have seen really any no knock warrants in West Virginia, though I hear about no knock entries. And so this kind of goes to that the case in Kentucky from the other day, the, the Breonna Taylor case. And I don't believe that was a no-knock warrant case, but it's the same sort of concern that I think a lot of us that are law-abiding, including myself, that we have because you know we have firepower close to our bed at night. And if we hear a bump in the night, you know, we're not necessarily just going to go running unarmed to see what it is. You know, we're going to grab a firearm and hopefully a flashlight and go see if there's something we need to do to protect our family. And so that is a really big concern of mine where you have no knock entries by law enforcement, because I mean, if boom, just the doors busted open, you have a commotion, you just wake up. I think you create a situation where you could have an innocent, completely innocent person involved in a shootout with the police and that that's just that's like the worst case scenario that I can think of. And it and it's it's happened before. And I don't know of any cases of it happening in West Virginia. So what do you have any position on and I don't know that it it's I guess law enforcement could request a no knock warrant without the prosecutor's permission. I suppose that could be different in 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 a in a county. Do you have I mean, do you have any any views or or policy differences do you think with your opponent regarding no knock warrants i don't i don't know that there's any policy difference you know what i would say about it is unfortunately there are circumstances where um those uh, interactions have been uh, fatal less than ideal uh, to call it less than ideal is isn't doing it isn't it doing it justice but what i will tell you is that no knock warrants do serve a purpose because uh, in many times in which a no knock warrant would be uh, rightfully granted you have law enforcement going into a situation that otherwise uh, has a high probability of of turning fatal to them Um, so i believe in order for them to be able to ask for it or, or for them to be able to ask for it uh, is in order for their safety to to protect them. Um, so I believe in situations where they are they can articulate uh, the necessity for it, they should be able to have access to it. That being said, uh, I believe that it should pass the highest scrutiny uh, within the chain of command of that individual uh, law enforcement agency to make sure that addresses are correct, uh, streets are correct, um, apartments are correct those types of issues the clerical issues that would cause some of the problems um with some of the instances we've seen nationwide so you know we've got to we've got to be able to uh, ensure the safety of of innocent bystanders sort of how misplaced hillbilly um, phrases it how about catching them outside their homes that that's sort of i i don't try to pretend I don't try to tell law enforcement how to do their job and they don't try to tell me how to do my job. So we have different areas of expertise, but at the same time, my area of expertise is, is constitutional law. And so I'm not talking about a tactics point of view, but I am kind of when I say, and he says, if somebody's so dangerous that, that the threat of getting, shot just trying to get into their house to execute a, an arrest warrant or search warrant to get them why not in that in those scenarios those most extreme scenarios why not just catch those guys outside their homes i mean it's like like black hawk down when you're going after a somali warlord you're not going to go get him in his bunker where he's got where he's got belt fed machine guns trained at the door you're going to catch him when he's driving through the desert and you just pull the helicopter upside him and, and, and blow it, you know, shoot his engine a few times. But I mean, silly example, but, but why not, why not, if you can catch them outside their home, 
where you can control the situation and the location, you know, why not do that instead? Right. I mean, I think I, I can come up with scenarios to answer that question, but, but, but what do you say? Right. I mean, I look, if you can catch them outside of their home, that that's great. Here's a couple of the problems with that though, is, you know, if they're an armed individual and you're trying to apprehend them outside of their home, um, you have a possibility for something to go wrong in a public space. Um, if they're in the middle of the desert, like like the scenario with Black Hawk Down, that's that's ideal. But if they're walking around the streets of town or or you know a populated area, uh, that may be less than ideal. You know, I think everything. I think we're properly illustrating it here is everything is so subjective and situational. Uh, that's why I believe that that you should really look at everything not under these objective check marks did you do do you do x y and z um i think you should look at the ind individual to be apprehended the area in which he lives the probability of catching them outside of their home um the the crime suspected to be a, you know committed um you know take for instance if there's an allegation someone has a hostage or, or a person that is being held against their will um there's an exigency that you would owe to the victim in that case to go ahead and 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 try to apprehend that individual as soon as possible and if you have a reasonable suspicion that they are in a particular domicile to go ahead and engage in that no knock activity to go in and, and try to and try to defuse that situation immediately so i think it just depends on the totality of the circumstances uh, that's sort of what when I, I'm trying to think of a scenario, just playing devil's advocate to myself. I think the big scenario for me that that would be say, you know, you have all these these child uh, sex trafficking cases in the news. I mean, where where the hell did these come from? But if if I was say if I was a prosecutor or a police officer and I found and, and I had good solid intelligence that one of like one of these missing kids that had been sex trafficked was inside a house i mean i think i think that's i think that is is one of those situations where especially if you fear for what this person could do to that kid then that would be one of those scenarios probably in my mind but then you know there's the point that under supreme court case law fourth circuit case law Police officers already have that option. So even if they don't, if they do, even if they don't have a no-knock warrant, if when they arrive at the scene, they're faced with exigent circumstances or some sort of emergency or something, something they see that tells them that if they knock on the door, something bad's going to happen. You know, they if they can articulate the reason why, they still have that choice even sure. even without a no-knock warrant. But you know it to go back to a time where like we had in West Virginia, where there had, there had been just a practice of no knock entries, just as a mat, this SWAT team um, uh, from the state police, they, that was their policy. That was their practice before I sued them was just every time. That's just what they did. They, they figure, well, hell, if, if, if they figured it was dangerous enough to call it the SWAT team, then, you know, we're not going to knock on the door. But instead of that was a policy, instead of looking at every individual situation, which you do ahead of time and say, look, you know, magistrate or circuit judge, this is why this is a date. This would be too dangerous to do that. And I, I actually was talking to to somebody who's pretty high up in, in law enforcement here just this past week who has a really a. a authority position on you know the training and and the the into the search warrant entries and and things of that nature who who I think kind of took the same view that that really this is is kind of you have that they're a tool that should be rarely 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 used and you know I, I think that is I think that's a good thing because I can think of cases where 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 it could be used, because it can be used anyways, and and uh, at the scene in ex exigent circumstances. But I think your policy is good, and uh, 
Do, do you, I guess you don't know one way or the other your opponent as far as whether she has a, a stance on on no knock entries or no knock warrants. No, I, I I don't know her particular stance on it in terms of of what her overt policy statement would be on it. Uh, I don't have that information. All right, you're you're getting some criticism from Jimmy Touchdown here. Uh, he says that you're you're not really convincing him. He thinks that you're sort of fear fear mongering. And that your no-knock policy should be a red flag. Um, so J- Jimmy Touchdown is challenging you to to tell him what are your fresh ideas. <laughs> uh, my fresh ideas is to, uh, while I am pro law enforcement um, in, in terms of of my policy platform, my uh, my personal beliefs, I do believe that there is a role in remedial criminal. Uh, policies. Those are the Supreme Court's uh, drug court policies. They used to be uh, used to be a mandate that every county had to engage in an adult drug court. Uh, now it is uh, it's permissive as to whether or not the counties are going to put forth the money to do it. We have one here. I used to be the prosecutor that was set on the board of it. And I can tell you that it's underutilized. Um, you know, as a figurehead of the organization, as the um, Sorry, I was reading a comment. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, as a figurehead of the organization, I would 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 reprise that role, and I would engage the adult drug court program um, at an earlier point to try to keep people uh, off this path. Um, I think there's two different types of individuals that engage in crimes that have a drug problem. There are those people that engage in crime because they have a drug problem. And there's those people that engage in crime that happen to coincidentally have a drug problem. The distinction is those people would commit crime whether or not they had a drug problem or not. So uh, let's identify those people. Let's use some interdisciplinary tools in our belt through the adult drug court system to to identify those individuals. And let's come up with some remedial measures that can be engaged in so we can avoid this population uh, that is walking around with a rampant drug problem here in Raleigh County. Um, We don't have the budgetary means, uh, nor do we have the physical ability to incarcerate every single person that commits a crime. So what can we do uh, in order to take those people and to turn them back into productive members of society that, that maybe they once were uh, but for their their drug addiction, and I can tell you that we used we didn't necessarily use Suboxone or, or anything Subutex. Uh, we used a drug called Vivitrol, and Vivitrol is a once monthly injection. It's usually administered uh, by by a, um, a healthcare professional. Uh, it has no street value. It has no you know you're not going to get high off Vivitrol, but what it will do is it will immediately uh, affect the body's a craving for opioids, specifically alcohol in some instances. Um, the only problem with Vivitrol is it doesn't help a methamphetamine addiction. So it will help you with heroin. It will help you with Oxycontin. It will help you with, with those types of things, fentanyl and, and, and those, those drugs that are really, really um, decimating our community. Um, if we can go in, and another problem with Vivitrol is your liver enzymes have to be um, – have to be optimum in order to take it, which really affects a lot of people that are uh, positive for hepatitis C. Um, they may not be eligible to take Vivitrol, but let's look at some other remedial measures for them. But the point being is m- my platform isn't incarcerate everyone that commits a crime. Um, my, my platform is let's incarcerate repeat offenders um, and those individuals that have committed multiple felonies and that have been in prison multiple times um, let's stop giving free passes to them and let's put some teeth back into the judicial system but i don't want to i don't want to fear monger so i will take jimmy touchdown's um, challenge and that we need to look at the lower end of the system as well and see what what remedial measures that we can engage in in order to help some of our community um, you know heal in terms of their drug addiction uh, because it is drastic, 
Um, and it is very real here in Raleigh County. Um, I, I just, I really want to touch on that. And I think it all starts when they're juveniles. Um, we have a juvenile justice system here that uh, to me really needs to focus more on drug treatment because when I was defending and when I was prosecuting, I will tell you that you know, 14 to 18, uh, you would be shocked at the amount of, of hard drug usage, hard, hard drugs mean uh, heroin, um, Oxycontin, methamphetamine that's being engaged in by a 14 to 18 year old population here in Raleigh County. So what in what ways can we intervene in those individuals lives and those juveniles lives um, to cut off some of this problem at the source? Because Jimmy Touchdown's right, it's not as simple as is incarcerating everyone. Um, that doesn't work in the long term. We have to look at systemically what will heal this population. So, what what is what is the current prosecutor doing that's different than than you want to do in that regards? Um, I'm trying to be nice. Uh, the current prosecutor. Well, I mean, you don't have to answer the question. If, if no, if, no, if, the, the the current prosecutor has allowed drug court to exist. Um, if you look at Judge Will Thompson down in Boone County, I mean, he run he, he runs probably the premier example of what an adult treatment court should look like. Um, and he's had some pretty good measurable success rates with that. So I don't think anyone can deny its success uh, because he has the statistics to back that up. I remember specifically him citing them back in his Supreme Court race. Uh, back in, in uh, I believe, 2018. Um, so I would say the current prosecutor has allowed them to exist. Um, but in terms of pro taking a proactive role, I would venture to say she's never been to a single drug court meeting. Uh, and I, I'm saying I would venture to say because I don't want to say that she hasn't and then someone proved me wrong. Um, but if it if she has, I would say it's probably one. Um, it's just not not high on a priority level uh, for her, um, which I think is in part reflected in the amount of of drug crime we have here in Raleigh County. Now, it, I'll say that one, and you don't again, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to go there. But sure, the you know, one of the things I've heard. And I've heard this for years. It's not, and honestly, I didn't even know, I think like a lot of people about your race and because it, these prosecutor races just aren't, they're, they're not really publicized very well and the media doesn't pay much attention to them. But I've, you know, I've been aware of the person that you're running against for a long time because I'm concerned with people's civil rights and people call me about all sorts of stuff. I hear all sorts of stories, most of which you never see on YouTube, you never hear about in a news story, uh, it never makes its way into a lawsuit, but I, I hear lots and lots and lots of stories. I've never tried a case specifically against the, the, the prosecutor over there, but I have handled some people's appeals and I've, I've read the transcripts of, of some of the I would call inflammatory things that she said during closing arguments before. And that's a whole different video. But as far as, uh, as far as her sort of bragging about herself, I mean, it seems like her, her platform that she's using to run against you is that she's the more experienced one. And obviously she's, she's been there since the eighties. She's put a lot of people in prison. It, it's, and I would argue that not, experience it can be good it also cannot be good because do we want a prosecutor who is the best at winning or we do or do we want a prosecutor that shares our our ideological beliefs and our our uh, our support for the second amendment and constitutional rights and things of that nature or do we want somebody who has 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 proven that she can win and that she has a lot of experience to do that. And I'll also add, I had heard, and you didn't tell me this, but I had heard that, you know, she has bragged that she's never lost a, a case, never lost a trial. And you and I are both trial lawyers. 
we've 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 both um, been there. I, I I don't want to speak for you, but I have lost jury trials. I've won jury trials I didn't think I was going to win, and I've lost jury trials that I thought I had in the bag. And I don't see how you can be a trial lawyer for since the since the the mid 1980s or the even the late 1980s and never have have lost a trial the only the only exception i could think is like somebody like jerry spence i don't know if he still has has never lost a trial but if you can pick any trial if, if you can just pick and choose the cases that you know that, that are going to be a piece of cake that you know that you're going to be able to win and that's what your concern is, is to to keep up this record of never having lost a trial. I think it probably could be done. But if you're actually taking real cases or, and giving yourself real responsibility and not passing it off to your subordinates, I don't see how you you could never not lose a trial. I mean, I, I know I know lots of prosecutors and a prosecutor here in, in my county. So, you know, we've been friends for years and 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 he's beaten me. I've beaten him. And I've, I've heard him kind of confide to me before that, you know, if if he loses, then, you know, he, he doesn't feel like he lost because you know that was his job to present the case to the to the jury. And, the, and the, if the jury found the person not guilty, then. You know, it, it, it went the way it was supposed to go. So th- whenever I first heard that she was really bragging about ha- never having lost the trial, I know that she's a good trial lawyer as far as effective because I've read, I've, I've spent hours reading some of her words and she 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 is very silver-tongued, I would describe. I mean, she she's good at stringing words together that are, are just brutal, especially against a male defendant. And, and so I see that as a danger, you know, being someone that's concerned about, I think the, the, my biggest concern is an innocent person being convicted. You know, I don't know if your main concern is not messing up your perfect record. I don't know if you have the same concern about, well, what if this person could be innocent? And what what happens if you find out even somebody you already convicted might be innocent? So I I don't see if I was a prosecutor I don't care how many cases I lost. You know it 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 it, it wouldn't factor in. And I like I, I think that you know. So I mean, do you have any do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it, I'll, what I'll is the you. role of a prosecutor? I, I will tell you the the. My thoughts on that is I, I won't speak. I won't speak specifically uh, with regard to any case that she's handled, uh, but I will tell you that my role and in, in what I want to do for the office is not be afraid to lose. And what I mean by that is, you know, to go in and try the tough case. If it's a case that that I believe I have enough evidence that I I'm sure that that. I have a case that is supported by evidence, not be afraid simply because I don't have that silver bullet confession or I don't have the event on video. Um, I, I, I don't want to be afraid to lose. Um, and so I want to take those shots because one of my fears is that a victim won't receive justice or a victim won't feel like they have been heard or a victim won't feel like that they have anyone advocating for them in the legal system simply because their case isn't locked tight and, and airproof. So, you know, we need to, as, as attorneys that work in this, in this system, this applies to both, both civil cases and criminal cases for that matter. I mean, don't be afraid to lose. Um, if, if everything was a virtual certainty, every case that you took was a virtual certainty, then, you know, as I said before, a number of us would be out of a job. Uh, but when we're prosecuting crime, there'll be a number of times that you have a case that you don't know how the jury's going to going to come going to come on that, going to split on it. Um, but you can't be afraid to take that shot. And um, she sometimes has 
different groups have, have approached me about wanting a fresh set of eyes in there to take the cases on that have been denied uh, prosecutorial access in the past. Well, if you want to talk about experience, I mean, I've always said that, I mean, I tried, I tried 30 something cases as a, as a prosecutor and I've, I don't know how many cases I've tried as a defense lawyer, but it's, it's been my opinion that being a prosecutor is really a piece of cake compared to being a defense attorney. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a thousand times more difficult because as a prosecutor, I mean, you, you have the elements that you're supposed to prove. I mean, and you're just, you're just going through the motions you, you, and you have this entire machine behind you of, of expert witnesses that are, um, that, that are attached to the state in some way. I mean, it's, it's easy, but to be the, the, the little guy, it's like David versus Goliath to be the little guy. You, I mean, it's super difficult. You have to, ha to have all these potential objections in your head at all time and be scanning for issues and, and listening constantly and paying close attention. And if you miss something, your clients can be screwed. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult job. And I think it's one of the most stressful jobs on the planet is trying a felony criminal case on the defense side. I mean, it's very difficult. And so in, in private practice, also in civil cases. Now, you, you right now are a plaintiff's lawyer, correct? Yeah, I would say that flips in the civil sense. Um, yeah, I would say yeah, that it's not a piece of cake in civil cases. To be I, I would say that I have a much harder job as a civil plaintiff's attorney proving up my case than I would defending it, doing insurance defense and defending, say, in an auto carrier or premises liability carrier. Um, you know, those those people basically um, take the stance that, you know, we're going to start at zero dollars and you're going to prove up not only liability but then you're going to prove up your damages so um you know it's it's uh it's it's very difficult to case build on plaintiff side civilly the defendant side in a criminal prosecution because you're you're starting from zero and you're building the case as you go along but just like you said um you have no you have no attachment to free experts or, or investigate investigation agencies to help you out like the insurance industry does in a civil sense or or the prosecutor's office does in, in a criminal sense yeah, i mean i think in experience wise being a civil plaintiff's lawyer um going through to to a jury trial is, is very difficult because not only do you have the burden of proof so you're you're playing prosecutor you're also basically on the defense of the entire time because you're also basically the, you know, by default, you're, you're the, the scumbag ambulance chaser and the, the client is faking some sort of an injury and you have to almost prove that wrong because people have these preconceived notions and the, the defense lawyers are very, very good. And, and they are good at, at putting, at putting those ideas in the jurors heads. I mean, it, I found it very, very difficult. Or you have a, a client that, you know, basically all you have to be is south or north rather of 50. And then the the insurance defense uh, lawyer will tell you that all of their problems were pre-existing. Um, so not that they're not having them, just not not the cause of us. Um, so they're pre-existing and it's the, either degenerative or from a prior acute injury or, or whatever the case is. And so you're you're constantly having having to distinguish how this injury is specific to this this particular instance. So you're you're exactly right. And and you're also having to 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 do uh, legal research and writing as well, right? Because you it's not like you have you you have a attorney general's office to handle appeals for you and and things of that nature. I mean, you you still have to do work. I don't know how it how it really works right now in Raleigh County, but there are other counties that I've, I've been in where there is almost no motions practice by, by the, by the prosecutor's office. I mean, you can submit, you can submit a 20 page, 20 page uh, motion and memorandum 
on on some sort of disputed legal issue and you'll get maybe nothing back or one or two pages of just kind of boilerplate response because they know the judge is going to deny it anyways but there's there's no i mean there's a lack of 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 just substantive you know legal work there in in some county i'm not sure how it works in raleigh county but as a i know that anywhere you are as a as a civil litigator you're having to both try cases and do legal research and writing at the same time which yeah, is good it, because i think it you, you stay on top of the issues and you know what you're talking about that's how my civil practice works now um that's not how you're you're kind of right and that's not how the criminal practice works here in raleigh county ideally that's how it works um but i'll tell you right you know when i took over the office um of assistant prosecuting attorney in 2017 we had a circuit court docket of indicted felony cases that was almost 700 cases i think it was 680 something if i'm remembering correctly um i had a great group of assistant prosecutors that worked with me um julie wisman who left for the attorney general's office uh, brandon Steele, who's now in the house of delegates uh, myself um we chipped away at that docket and we by the time i had left i was the last one to leave uh, we just got exhausted we had chipped it away and had moved it down to around 350 cases and i keep in mind you're talking 600 and some cases for four prosecutors that that handle those those the majority of those cases so the the office staff is bigger but in terms of felony prosecutors the way it worked was the four of us handled the majority of those minus capital offenses which my opponent kept for herself so roughly 680 some cases for us we had shipped it away down to around 350 um, but to where motions practice and an actual coordination of the, the criminal justice system was possible um, now I've, I've been gone for two years and two months i think and it's back up over 700 now um so it's it's doubled since i left and what that means is can you really diligently practice law on each individual case um you know i i don't know <laughs> with with 700 for four for four prosecutors on a regular basis well you I, know I it's I find it very that's, difficult. That's sort of like civil litigation as well, because you know, if if the if a particular insurance company or, or defense firm, I mean, if they're if they're gonna, I mean, they can't try every case. So, I mean, if if, if uh, I mean, if everybody wants to take their cases to trial, it will overwhelm them. You know, they're not going to do it. I've seen criminal defense lawyers do that as well. Is where where the prosecutor's office isn't isn't making fair deals. Just everybody sort of push forward towards trial because they can't try them all, and it, and it just overwhelms overwhelms them. So, yeah, I mean, so it those are things that go into running a prosecutor's office that maybe you don't even even think about. Um, J Jimmy, let me get the Jimmy touchdown one more time here. All right, he's got he's got another comment, and you know you can. I'll ask the question and you can answer it or not answer it. Let's see. Raleigh County Magistrate Stephen D. Massey is facing seven charges of judicial conduct and is Benny's neighbor. I guess you're Benny. Benny gave a sweet plea deal before he re resigned from the DA office. Could, could you elaborate? So just to preface the question, um, Magistrate Massey was – was a magistrate judge in Raleigh County. And I believe the Judicial Investigation Commission had filed a statement of charges against him. And he ended up, I think, resigning. I'm, I'm not sure. And I know now his seat is open for the next, next election. So Jimmy Touchdown apparently knows um, and knows Magistrate Massey or, or, or something um, that's going on there. So if you want to elaborate, um, he really wants to hear your answer on this. Um, I, I will, will touch on it briefly, which is that activity that, that involves me said, gave a sweet plea deal. The deal that I offered, 
uh, to the individual defendant that was charged. He was charged with three crimes. The deal I offered was for him to plead to two of the three things he was charged with and be put on probation. Um, he was a first time offender. Uh, they were misdemeanor crimes to begin with. And essentially I gave the deal that would have been given to any criminal defendant uh, facing like or similar circumstances. Um, and I'll even note, uh, once that case ended up going to trial, uh, a neutral magistrate, a different magistrate that, that had no dealing in the case, um, actually ended up giving that defendant the exact same sentence that I offered uh, in my plea deal. Now, it's a little bit incorrect because it says that the magistrate was facing seven charges of judicial conduct, um, and that part's true. But it was the allegation was involving that Magistrate Massey tried to influence the criminal justice system for a friend of his. So the friend of his was a criminal defendant, not the magistrate. Um, so the friend of his that was the criminal defendant is the one that I made a plea deal to, which was pleaded two of the three things that they were charged with, only discharging one of the offenses and to be put on unsupervised probation. Um, so standard deal and not a sweetheart deal by any means. And then once the, the case ended up going to trial, um, a neutral magistrate actually ended up finding, uh, I think it was a, ended up being a bench trial if I'm remembering correctly, but the neutral magistrate ended up finding uh, the defendant guilty, but sentencing him to an almost identical sentence that I had offered in my plea deal. So, um, not not a whole lot to, to really talk about there. And I don't think he's facing charges right now. My understanding, no. having looked into the whole judicial charge scenario lately in that same county, is from my understanding that he had been charged by the GAIC, and those aren't criminal charges, but he had been charged and then came to some sort of plea deal or resolution with the disciplinary folks that he would not only resign or stay resigned, but also not run for office again or judicial office again for, for like 10 years. So I don't think that there are any charges now pending. Is there, that right? I, I believe that to be true. I believe that those have been resolved and that criminal charges were, were never were never brought because there was no criminal violation. Uh, the criminal yeah, violation it, was against the name, was against the friend of his. I, I take it that, the friend, the friend of his might be Jimmy. I mean, he, he, <laughs> apparently, he apparently has has some connection to to the alleged victim in that case. But he's he's then uh, this goes back to what we're talking about. If you have a prosecutor that is can't is 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 swayed very easily by by the the, the victim's family or the alleged victim's family or 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 any any party, I, I think you you have in an unfair system, in my opinion, you know, I mean, if you're going to be the prosecutor, then, you know, the buck stops with you as far as the charging decision. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear that you got to make sure it's okay with the, with the police officer. You know what? He's not the prosecutor. He didn't have a law degree. You do. He, you know, he's not the prosecutor you are. So while I, I can sympathize with wanting to, to, uh, have the police officer who charged the case on board or having the victim's family on board. I mean, in the end, if you never go against that, then justice is not going to be done in some cases. I mean, you, you got to be willing to go make your own decisions and go against the grain. So that that's my strong feeling on, on that. Obviously I've dealt with it before. Uh, I, let's see. I had a great question for you. Oh, since today was, I don't know if you watched the Amy Coney Barrett nomination hearings. Did you watch those at all? I, I didn't. Yeah, I I had to work all day today too. I I didn't get to watch, to watch any of that. I'm I'm sure that I'll see some of the snippets of it later. Um, well, listen, John, I I appreciate you having me on. Um, 
I, I can't tell you enough how much, you know, you go to these programs. We had Meet the Candidates last week, and um, I go up there. I, I'm up there at 630, and it's a, it's a, it's a decent program. It's run by the uh, Raleigh, Beckley Raleigh County Chamber of Commerce. But they started running out of time, and we couldn't take any questions from the media panel, and they gave us 90 seconds to, to, to you know, 90 seconds go. And I mean, there's not a lot I can say in a minute and a half. So I really appreciate platforms like this that will let me engage in discussions about what I believe, what my experiences are, what my plans are if I get the chance. And um, I can't tell you enough how important this is for the people in Raleigh County because we don't have a lot of those media outlets um, to engage in long form discussions. And the media does a good job here in terms of of keeping people informed, but long form discussion on a local level um, is is lacking. Um, I always said a lot of people get really jazzed about going to vote for for the presidential candidate every four years when really if they want to affect positive change in their daily lives um, they should get jazzed to vote for the sheriff or the prosecuting attorney or the county commission or their local delegate or state senator um, because that's where they're going to realize change in their daily lives um, I, I really and firmly believe that and that's not just my race that's the state Senate race and, and your local delegates race and and all those races uh, that are coming up uh, on November 4th in your community, whether it's Raleigh County, Monroe County or any of the neighboring counties. Um, just make sure that you're informed on the candidates and your viewers are, whether they agree with me or not. Uh, they they are, are at least watching this in an attempt to be informed um, and make sure that they go exercise their right to vote for their candidate for whatever it is they believe in, whatever whatever community they want to see, whatever America they want to see, to go out and vote for that candidate. Well, I uh, I appreciate you you coming on, Ben, and and we'll have to do it again sometime. And the the problem is there's there's just too many topics to go over, right. and and I mean because it's it's there's look at all the cases in the news. I mean, these are all prosecutorial decisions. So for someone not to understand why political affiliation or politics isn't something you need to know about in prosecutor races, I mean, just just watch the news tonight. So anyways, I'll hopefully talk to you again soon. And thanks for coming on. I uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, John. All right. And if you are in Raleigh County or if you're anywhere and you want to, to help uh, Mr. Hatfield's campaign, you can send a check. I think I put the address and and the description of the post, but I'm I'm sure it, anything can help. If but if you're in Raleigh County or you have family in Raleigh County, just like all these county positions are flipping all over Southern West Virginia, this is a seat that the Republicans need to have. Is is you know the the prosecutor seat. Because any prosecutor that is adopting the national platform right now of the Democrat Party, you, you, you might have a problem because they don't believe in the ownership of AR-15s. They want to, to register them, to confiscate them. I mean, look, Joe Biden put, put um, Beto O'Rourke in charge of his, his uh, firearms policy. The fact is that not only do they not support the ownership of AR-15s, they don't support the Second Amendment all, at all. They don't see the the Second Amendment and the, the ownership of firearms as being one of our natural rights that, that we were born with. That is an ideological difference that you'll see between the Republican platform and the Democrat platform. So you need to look at these races and that's not to say that every Democrat running for prosecutor around West Virginia doesn't see things exactly, you know, the 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 same way that I do. They they may or may not. But you you look at, at some of these places around West Virginia and you'll see talk about swamps and swamp creatures, places where you know there's been corruption and there's been there's been um 
there's been just a tight relationship between a small group of people, a small group of, of, you know, liberal Democrats really, in a lot of these places. And it's just now changing all over the state of West Virginia. Uh, so pay attention to this race. If you're in Raleigh County, you know, Hatfield had more votes in the Republican primary, I believe, than the Democrat challenger did. And as they say, in some of these counties, I mean, people are not going to vote for Democrats anymore. They don't like what what they've been doing on a national level. And they're not going to vote for him for dog catcher anymore. So any candidate who is putting the Democrat in front of their name, you have to ask them and ask yourself, are they in line with the Democrat Party platform? You know, would they charge the McCloskeys under the scenario that occurred, or would they not charge the McCloskeys? Would they charge Rittenhouse, Kyle Rittenhouse, or would they not charge Kyle Rittenhouse? Because why is that important? Because are they going to charge you if if a mob comes to your house and they threaten to burn it down or do whatever, and you stand outside with your AR-15, are you going to get prosecuted? Well, is your prosecutor in your jurisdiction a Republican or a Democrat? What, what Are they anti-gun? Are they pro-gun? Those are things that you need to know. There's probably no other position that's, more, that's as important to somebody who values the Second Amendment and the right of self-defense than that of your local elected prosecutor. The McCloskey's made a big, uh, uh, poor choice. It was a poor choice to live somewhere where they didn't have the backing of their, of their local prosecutor. They have the power to charge you. So choose wisely your politicians, obviously, but make sure you understand the importance of these prosecutor racists. For instance, you can look at the outlaw barber case in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, Mr. Jenkins is still being prosecuted. He was the combat or not military veteran, elderly barber who got arrested for opening his barber shop during the lockdown. He's still being prosecuted, even though the the West Virginia Attorney General came out and and expressed support for him and got the administrative investigation against him dropped. The, the Attorney General's office can't control the local prosecutor. That's how powerful the local elected prosecutors are. So nobody can stop that prosecution except for either the prosecutor or the judge. You know, but judges are very much limited and being able to dismiss criminal charges. It's very, the, the case law is basically that they, they can dismiss it before trial only if there's some sort of fraud that they discovered and it was intentional by the prosecutor. So it's very, very rare to get a case dismissed before trial because judges don't want to do it. They don't have a whole lot of ability to do it. So the choice of who your prosecutor is is extremely important. If you're in Raleigh County, that's the county where I posted the video of the family court judge searching the house and the, the lawyer that accompanied the judge into the house is a longtime lawyer in that County who apparently has donated $2,000 to this prosecutor's campaign. Now that's perfectly legal, but why do I bring it up? Because a lot of people have asked me, well, is, are there going to be any criminal charges for what happened? Clearly, the Judicial Investigation Commission found that that was not lawful for a, a judge to, to search a house. Well, are there going to be any, any criminal charges where you have the person making that decision has, is receiving financial uh, support from one of the people involved? So that's the sort of thing that you need to educate yourself about. And not that that surprises anybody because you go into any of these you know, small towns or, or counties and rural areas and you, you expect to find that people are close, very close. And, and there's all sorts of, of stuff going on. So if you're in Raleigh County or you have family in Raleigh County around Beckley, West Virginia, Make sure that they know that Ben Hatfield is running and on the on the uh, as the Republican nominee for prosecuting attorney there. 
just ask them, do they want the Republican policies or do they want Democrat policies? Are they voting for Donald Trump or are they voting for Joe Biden? It does, the opposing candidate has chosen to put to make herself a Democrat to identify with the ideology of the Democrat Party. Look at their campaign platform. Is that who you want, the Democrat Party, making the decisions that may or may not put you in, pr in prison for the rest of your life? So look at those policies. Look and see who your candidates are. These are political races. This is a Republican versus a Democrat. So make sure that your, your family members that are in Raleigh County, that I don't know if that county's flipped completely not uh, or yet not or not yet. It's getting late. But I would I would urge them to to look into this race and and you know if they have other questions, ask the other candidates, see if she answers the questions. See if she answers the questions about the Second Amendment, about the McCloskeys, about Rittenhouse and and uh, Mr. Hatfield, he, I mean, he's willing to to take pretty much any question. So I enjoyed the discussion. I appreciate you uh, you participating. And until next time, um, probably next next Monday. Though I am doing a video with Marshall Wilson on the nineteenth. Well, that is next Monday, isn't it? So that's probably what I'll be doing then. But um, just make sure that you subscribe to the page if you're on YouTube and enable notifications so that you are, are notified when we go live. Same thing for Facebook. And again, I appreciate you watching and, and uh, remember that freedom is scary, but it doesn't have to be.